Hi everyone, we're going to be talking about the professional roles um, in being a part of a healthy work environment. So our healthcare facilities are, are probably one of the most dangerous uh, work environments in the U.S. Uh, we are we deal, deal with infectious diseases and at this recording what we're dealing with is the COVID virus. Um, you know, we got airborne pathogens with that. We have exposure to mucus and bodily fluids, physical violence, patient and family members. Uh, we look at lateral violence. We're going to be looking at these very closely throughout this lecture. We are looking at ergonomic injuries, uh, exposure to hazardous chemicals and radiation. We have sharps injuries that we can uh, encounter, uh, slips and falls, and then understaffing. Understaffing puts a lot of pressure on us to work faster without adequate assistance. There are somewhere between 600,000 to 1 million needle stick injuries that occur annually in the U.S. Uh, so this places us at risk of HIV, Hep B, Hep C, and any other bloodborne pathogens. 2001, a psychiatric nurse with 20 years of experience died from head and facial trauma after being attacked by one of her patients. That's, a, that's, that's pretty bad. Um, it is estimated that nurses suffer 35,000 back and other injuries every year. 21% of RNs and nursing students report being physically assaulted and over 50% were verbally abused in a 12 month period. Additionally, 12% of ER nurses experienced physical violence and greater than 59% reported verbal abuse. <laughs> Imagine that. Psych is reported as one of the highest risk work areas for violence. Um, has anybody ever experienced physical violence in the workplace? Um, I experienced it in when I was doing my mental health rotation uh, as a nursing student. You know, they, they tell us in mental health, and I, I'm, I'm sure they still tell you that if a patient's coming at you, you know, move away from them. Um, so this is what this is what we were taught. Uh, I was on 8A, and I don't know how it's set up now, but when you walked onto the unit, there was the nurse's station, and you turned left and made another left, walked through a common area, and made another left into a hallway that led you down to where the, the therapy work, rooms were. I was on my way down to a therapy room to, to sit in with the patient that I was following that day. And as I rounded that corner, I saw a gentleman come from one of the rooms and he took off running and it just happened so fast. So I'm on one side of the hall <laughs> <laughs> I moved to the other side he moved with me and I moved back and he moved back so I moved back again this happened like in a matter of seconds and as I moved back he I didn't have time to protect myself nothing he came running at me and slapped me right across the chest and when he did you could you heard that slap all the way at the nurse's station the nurses were came running because they didn't know what had happened. They they just heard it, and they saw me standing there, and I was just a, I was in shock. And already you could see the handprint across my chest, um, and I was I, I was kind of like this right here in pain because your your sternum and that that skin it was all just oh, and so they sent me to be checked and make sure have an x-ray make sure my sternum wasn't cracked um, came back to clinical I was released to come back everything was fine the next day though I had this huge massive handprint bruise on my chest it oh I had thought that I wanted to work in psych because I loved it I thought it was amazing being there um, I loved dealing with the patients you get such a wide variety of them and my husband said, no, mm -mm, no, that's not happening. You cannot go work in that area. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about OSHA. Just kind of introduce everybody to the, to the different ones that 
ensure that we have uh, we have safety in the workplace. And I think we all know who OSHA is. Uh, they're responsible for developing and enforcing workplace safety and health regulations. The goal for from OSHA OSHA huh, is to prevent injuries and illness and and save the lives of employees across the U.S. It's up to the employers to make sure they follow those regulations and uh, they keep those regulations up, uh, those safety measures up, rather, uh, even when OSHA is not there. Because OSHA can make surprise visits on, on employers. Uh, they, 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 you have to keep records uh, of the employee, job-related illnesses and accidents. And these can be chemical exposures, lacerations. Um, it can be loss of limb, depending on uh, where a person works. My husband works in an industry that's, that's pretty dangerous. It's a, it's a steel place. So they, you know, they would have, they have uh, often some, some smash injuries to, to hands, to fingers, um, to feet, and they've also had loss of limb. Um, there can be hearing loss, um, respiratory exposure, musculoskeletal injuries, and exposure to infectious diseases. The CDC. Our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, they partner with other agencies to investigate health problems, they conduct research, they implement preventative strategies, promote safety in healthy uh, environments, and right now we are hearing so much from the CDC and what is going on with our, our COVID mess. I, I, I know it's a COVID mess, but it is, it is what it is. Um, it, uh, it's that way for just about every, uh, not just about, it is that way for every health facility uh, around in the U.S. They do publish continuous updates on recommendations for prevention of IV transmission in the workplace, uh, any universal precautions uh, related to bloodborne pathogens and other infectious diseases such as viral diseases right now. Uh, they target public health emergency preparedness and response related to uh, biological and chemical agents and threats. I know when I was finishing up my MSN, or actually starting it, uh, forgive me, starting my MSN, I went through ATU, finished my BSN there, and then started my, my MSN. And they had two tracks. They had MSN administrative, and then they had MSN... Um, yeah, you can't see my fingers. I was sitting there holding up number two to the side. Uh, they had the MSN uh, emergency management track. And a lot of faculty that were going through uh, Arkansas Tech at that time uh, chose that emergency uh, preparedness there. I, I chose the administrative. But anyway, they I had to take a couple of courses, though, uh, over emergency management and there there was a lot of things that I never thought about for uh, safety in the workplace and uh, biological and chemical agents and, and other threats out there. Ooh, I mean, you. I guess I, I, I don't want to say I live in a, you know, looking through rose-colored glasses, uh, but I, I always think that Everybody is inherently good, and there's, you know, I don't want to think about anything bad, and so it it was a it was pretty eye opening to to see about um, the biologic and chemical things that threats that we have out there. Okay, so our American Nurses Association, they provide us with up to date related workplace advocacy and safety for all nurses. If you haven't been on their website, go to the website. Find out some, some information. I, I'm, knowledge is power. And if you can figure out a way to, to beef up your knowledge with these agencies, I suggest going to their website so that you can. They, in 1999, established its Commission on Workplace Advocacy, which addressed collective bargaining, uh, workplace violence, mandatory overtime, staffing ratios, conflict ma management, delegation, ethical issues, compensation, needle stick, stick safety, latex allergies, and ergonomics. Our Joint Commission 
If you ha work in a facility who has to deal with joint commission, um, you you know that it is a it, it's it's a stressful time when they're coming around. Uh, that to maintain the accreditation through joint commission, organizations must have an extensive on-site review. Uh, they look at workplace safety, um, and they'll send in a team of joint commission healthcare professionals, and they'll come in like every three years. And if again, if you've ever been part of that, you know that it is rather stressful for nurses, for supervisors for uh, actually anybody in management. Uh, we have accreditation uh, that we have done at the school often, and it it gets kind of hairy at that time. Everybody's like, oh my God. Um, and I had a supervisor at the hospital that every time Joint Commission came along, I mean, she was, she was on us, making sure she's going through the charts, you know, and, uh, make and that was when we had paper charts y'all so that's a while ago um making sure that we were uh, charting everything appropriately and that we weren't uh, making range orders that was that was back when range orders were at first they were good and then they were bad that's kind of how it is in healthcare at first something is good it's okay and then all of a sudden whoop, it's not so much it's bad so that's kind of how some of these accrediting bodies are. All right, so now we also have the IOM, the Institute of Medicine. It is a private, non-governmental organization whose mission is to improve health of people everywhere. Keeping patients safe and transforming the work environments for nurses in 2004. This is a report that identified concerns related to organizational management, workforce deployment practices, work design, and organizational culture. And we do listen to the IOM. We take whatever report that they put, they put out and that is, that is a, that's big time what we do. We listen to them. We want to make sure that we're, you know, it's like healthy people 2020. We're going to pay attention to healthy people 2020. Uh, we want to do this uh, to find out what initiatives are out there. To, to ensure that our patients are healthy. If it looked like I paused, I, I did, because I was noticing my lights were kind of seeming to go in and out on y'all's little screen here, so I turned on some more. I didn't want anything to be distracting. Okay, so federal laws, uh, are initiated to protect the workers. Um, we have in 1963 the, the Equal Pay Act. In 1964 we have the Civil Rights Act. In 1967 Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Boy, I, I need that one right now. I mean, I, I, I need that because it's coming up for me. Uh, Pregnancy Discrimination Act in 1968. 1973 Vocational Rehab Act. 1974, the Family Education Rights Privacy Act, a FERPA, we, we talk about FERPA a lot. Americans with Disability Act of 1990. 1993 was the Family Medical Leave Act, and if you don't know about Family Medical Leave, I, I highly suggest that you, you talk about, you look up what that is, if, or I'll tell you actually, the Family Medical Leave Act is designed to protect you in your job if you have to leave for any medical reason, uh, taking care of a sick loved one, um, the birth of your child, anything, uh, it protects you during that time. They cannot do anything to your job. They cannot give your position away. They, they have to maintain uh, that position for you. And you can have t a three months out of a 12 month period <coughs> if need be. If you need intermittent FMLA, Let's say for me last year, I had to go on intermittent FMLA because my mother was so sick. It was before she passed and um, I was taking her back and forth to doctor's appointments. So I, I, I really stress this and, and, I, and I do it not because it's going to be test related. I, I can't remember if I have a test question or not, but I stress it because I care about you. 
and I care about you knowing about the FMLA um, because I, I want you going into your place of employment knowing that and it does take a year before you can actually utilize it but I want you to know that a year in if you get pregnant um, if you need to take off for anything for uh, for a sick family member for um, adoption anything like this um, you need to familiarize yourself with it with your company uh, fill out the appropriate paperwork so that you are are, are protected uh, the last act that we have on here is the needle safety and prevention act of 2001 All right, so the statistics listed on this slide are violent episodes healthcare workers experience from patients. <coughs> I'm so sorry. In a recent 2015 OSHA study that I read, the statistics for violent injuries resulting in days away from work by industry were pretty astounding for healthcare. It was four times more common for healthcare workers to experience uh, workplace violence that had to, they had to take off for afterwards. And this includes physical assault, uh, threats of assault, and verbal abuse. I just told you in previous slides about about my physical assault. Um, beyond that, the only thing that I've encountered is is verbal abuse. So of course you get you get patients and, and family members who are always not going to be happy. I can't, I, I'm going to, I laughed at it, but now, but the previously uh, when it happened, I was a little on the shock side. Uh, we're a Baptist facility, so you, you would expect that you, when you come in, that people can pray. And so I was taking care of a patient um, whose family came in and they were, well, they they prayed um, quite loudly, um, and I completely understand, and, and it's okay with me. I'm I'm Pentecostal. I go to Pentecostal church, and and yeah, there's there's people are loud when they pray, and it's how you, however you express your your religion, your your love for Jesus, and what have you, and so <clears throat> they were. They were expressing loudly, and <laughs> the room over could hear them. And I, I happened to have been in that room while they were praying, and I didn't want to, <laughs> didn't want to slip out, because it, I just felt like it was rude for me to leave while they started their prayer. So, you know, I stayed there praying with them. And so, um, when I walked out of the room, they told me that the room next door was asking for me. So I went in there and um, the patient and the family members asked if we could encourage or if we could make the room next door. It's not encourage. It was make that room next door. Stop that praying. Well, I can't stop them from praying. And I did explain this. I Sorry, I, this is a Baptist facility. And so we do allow praying in this facility. We do not. We do not stop it. Um, it was met with some cursing. Um, they were not very happy with me. Ultimately, I ended up having to go next door and ask them if they could, uh, when they pray next time, pray quieter. Um, I didn't mind doing that, but I couldn't go next door and, and tell them they had to stop praying because somebody didn't like it and they didn't like the sound of it. They didn't like to hear it. Um, they they didn't want to hear about about Jesus. They didn't want to hear that type of uh, of talk, and it, it, there was a lot to it. And so you find that you you get in situations where you are probably more than than physical and, and uh, uh, verbal assaults. You you're probably are more than threats of assault. Uh, you're probably going to end up with a lot of verbal abuse. But be on the lookout. I was in a um, in service once, and it was a safety in service. And he said that he was telling about a woman who went to go uh, get on the elevator. I think it was it was her apartment building, and she had to park, you know, down in the lower levels in the uh, parking parking deck that they had. And so um, 
she went to go get on the elevator and she pushed the button doors open and this gentleman walked off and as he breathed by her she just felt the hairs on her neck stand up and so she dismissed it got on in the elevator and I mean she, her defenses were down and he jumped on at uh, into the elevator uh, like maybe he forgot something and uh, so she was she was already uncomfortable because the hairs on the back of her neck stood up and it with good reason he was not back on there because he needed to go back up to uh, because he forgot something he uh, raped her on the elevator so I feel like that we need to listen to our bodies I'm all about the the sixth sense telling you something and if the hair on the back of your neck stands up because something just doesn't feel right uh, just you know pick up your senses and and be more alert to though those type of situations so you don't get yourself into a situation where you are physically assaulted um, full-time uh, private full-time workers two out of ten thousand uh, reported uh, being physically uh, assaulted threatened or verbal abused health service workers 9.3 out of 10,000 social service worker 15 out of 10,000 and nurses and personal caregivers 25 out of 10,000 all right some circumstances contributing to contributing to increased rate for health care workers for abuse um, or workplace violence units for treating violent individuals patients needing seclusion or restraint increased number of acute and chronic mentally ill patients working late hours working in high crime areas uh, treating weapons carrying patients or families long wait times for service who I've seen some people when you've been sitting in doctor's offices for a while that they will get fired up waiting to go and see that physician because they're having to to wait so long um, inexperienced staff overcrowded or uncomfortable waiting areas so what about some clues that may indicate a potential for violence but <laughs> sorry um, history of a violent behavior delusional paranoid or suspicious speech aggressive or threatening statements rapid speech angry tone of voice pacing a tense posture clenched, clenched fist a tightening of the jaw or alcohol or drug use I used to work um, in a revenue office I know I was one of those people you love to hate <laughs> no. I, I love telling people that I, I worked there for several years I actually thoroughly enjoyed it if I could have made more money with the state then I might have actually stayed um, no I, I had to quit for some uh, circumstances beyond my control and that was just my car accident that caused my my daughter to suffer a traumatic head injury so um, but I, I loved working there and I worked at the one on seventh and battery uh, and it was the primary one so we saw a lot of individuals when they were getting out of prison who would uh, come over to our uh, place so that they could get um, we, their state ID so this gentleman came in once and he was gigantic not like like gigantic weight but I'm talking gigantic he probably he was probably I would say six foot three four five somewhere in there and so when he walked in the door he had a look on his face and I mean we we become attuned to these things and and so sister porch uh, that's what we called her she sat next to me and miss porch and she said mm, girl <laughs> And I said yes ma'am <laughs> so we just kept our eye on him and so I was the lucky one with the draw <laughs> I called his number and he came up and so 
as it is the same way now, uh, as far as I know, you have to have uh, two forms of identification in order to uh, get a state ID. One of the forms is your parole papers, which he had, but that was it. And so <laughs> I said, sir, I'm really sorry. I hate to tell you this, but I'm going to need another form of identification. I have a list and I couldn't even get a list out. Um, before he started throwing one massive cussing fit. And so at this time, my supervisor is in the back and she hears it and she comes beelining out there. And now Kim was, uh, her husband worked at, uh, detail, uh, state police for, and he is detail for the governor. So I guess that she just had this kind of mentality that she could deal with anything and she could face anyone and it didn't matter, didn't matter what or who. And she was no taller than me. I, I, she was probably actually an inch shorter. So five foot two and she gets behind me and she is, starts pointing her finger at him about cussing at her employees. And he starts cussing her because he's mad because he wants a, a state ID. And she's telling him all the things that he can bring in there for a state ID. And the next thing I know, <laughs> she is she is so angry with him because he's so angry with her. that she's behind me and I'm pushed like this. I know you're going to love that on your screen. <laughs> but I'm pushed like this. And I'm looking up at him like like. I gotta get, I'm looking up at him like this, and he is over my desk, so we're kind of face to face, and I thought he was probably going to take my head off, because she was putting me in such a precarious situation, he ended up, and, and by the way, on his parole papers, he had <laughs> been in prison for assault and battery, so, I mean, I'd seen that, and I was already kind of apprehensive. So when he left, we had this door that you would see people when they came into our, our facility. They were just dug on that door. It was so hard to open. It was heavy. I mean, that was the heaviest glass door I think I've ever encountered. I, I don't, it wasn't bulletproof, but it was heavy. He took that door and slammed it all the way back thought it was going to break off the hinges. We have never seen anybody do that before. He never came back, um, but I was really thankful because <laughs> I was afraid Kim Allen was going to have me killed. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hope y'all enjoyed that little funny story that I told. So we need to prevent workplace violence. Um, regularly in, uh, participate in ongoing workplace safety assessments, in services, training, writing policies. Get in on writing those policies and make sure you know what those policies are. Uh, be alert to behaviors that precede that violence. Again, I was telling you, Sister Port said, mm, she was following her gut when he walked in. Know your patients. Maintain behavior that helps to diffuse if you cannot. Uh, diffuse the anger if you cannot diffuse it uh, what do we need to do remove yourself from the situation don't be like my Kim Allen that was behind me pushing me forward and pointing her finger in his face okay um, call security and uh, report the information to your manager So horizontal violence. I remember when I came back from vacation uh, once that, uh, and this was this was years ago. Remember, because I did paper charting. Um, we had a new policy up on the bulletin board, and someone said, "Elena, have you read the new policy that we have? Horizontal violence. What? What is this?" I, <laughs> I hesitate to tell y'all what I thought, <laughs> but. I always feel like y'all need a little chuckle in the uh, <laughs> in your lectures. So I, I thought it was uh, some type of, of of rape that occurred um, in the hospital, <laughs> and I, so I had to read the policy, of course, to follow it. And I, I read it once, and I was like, oh, "Wait a minute, let me let me go back up here because that, what I thought was <laughs> certainly not right." <laughs> 
Um, it's also called incivility or bullying in the workplace. This could include verbal abuse, um, punishment, humiliating comments, and malicious gossip. It may come from your coworkers, superiors, subordinates, and the Joint Commission doesn't like horizontal violence. They they have policies against it. It's it's a big thing. Um, it is a sentinel event because it may pose a threat to, to patient safety. Um, in some of my lectures, I do tend to mention, discuss, or allude to the presence of horizontal violence in the workplace. Um, it's not by chance. Uh, there, uh, I, there is, um, I do have a story, uh, and I hope that y'all forgive my stories in this one, but um, this one, this one is, it pertains to me again. I was a brand new nurse. I wanted to work in CVICU. That was just the place that I wanted to be. So I went there um, excited to, to learn and to, to build on my nursing career. And they gave me a, a young preceptor who at first was, was really nice. And I'm going to, I'm just going to call her, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll just call her T. <laughs> so T seemed very, very nice at first. She was a BSN graduate from uh, another school. And um, so she really, in her comments and her attitude, looked down on Baptist Health uh, graduates because we had diplomas. So I dealt with her for a month. Um, I mean, she was verbally abusive. Uh, she embarrassed me in front of patient family members, in front of patients, uh, in front of other staff. Um, I just... On my days there, I wanted to cry. I could not wait to leave. And on my days off, I cried. My husband said one time, okay, Elena, that, that's enough. Honey, You, I come home and ask you how you're doing and you break out in tears. You know, we have to do something about this. I didn't want to because I wanted to work CVICU. So... Um, I went in, we had a thoraco-abdominal aortic aneurysm repair that we were following that day. I learned a lot of new things on this patient that day. Um, he had a, a drain in for CSF, and the drain had a, a stopcock on it, you know, where you turn it and it'll flow, or turn it off and it, turn, it, it stops the flow. And that was to prevent his ICPs from going above 10. If they went about above 10, we had to drain some CSF off. So, I mean, my natural first question, and I feel like that anybody's natural first question would be, so how long do we do we turn the stopcock and, and drain the CSF? I mean, it seems like a natural question to me. Um, I, and I'm, an, I'm a newbie nurse. I, I don't know these things. And there's a lot of things I realize now. Uh, she looked at me and she says, well, put it this way. Leave it on too long, kill your patient. Don't leave it on long enough. And you're going to, you're going to tick off the physician, except that's not what she said. So I said, oh, okay, I, I understand. And so I was petrified. To, to turn it on, I turn it on and I watch his ICP go down. I turn turn it off just a little bit and then it go back up and, and I turn it off. And so I learned to, I had to stand there and learn how long to actually leave the stopcock on. So the next thing that we were doing was hanging blood. I mean, do y'all hang blood in nursing school? Absolutely not. We just don't do that. And so I, I'm in there hanging blood for the first time for this patient. And I'm trying to remember for the life of me, Jesus help, because I, I'm trying to remember what is what I need to do first. So she checked checked bands with me. She uh, she checked uh, 
check the band uh, armband against the the unit of blood and so then I start to do everything and I'm a verbal person I like to verbalize what I'm doing um, I feel like if I verbalize it that it helps me to learn as I'm doing it. Um, it it's just it's who I am and if you're going to be a preceptor you need to learn these things about your 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 nursing uh, your new nurses you need to learn uh, how they they go about learning um, and she wasn't interested in that at all so I was verbalizing back to her and I could see this look on her face so I finally said um T yeah Am I asking too many questions for you? <sighs> it's not that you're asking too many questions. It's just that you're asking questions that take plain old common sense. Okay. Okay, I'm I'm sorry. I, I understand. Went back to what I was doing, hoping and praying to God that I was I was doing my blood right. I sat back down next to her doing my vital signs and she hands me we had a CVICU Bible and it was like a four inch binder so it was really thick and she flipped through the pages and she marked out um, I think four chapters for me to read and study that night well hello oh cuz she was gonna quiz me the next day I first of all had three children at home waiting on me um, I, and I can't remember it seems like my stepchildren were due over that night so that would be five um, five five kiddos that 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 need mom's attention and I, I don't leave there until seven o'clock I don't get home until 7 30 7 45 I don't see that I'm going to be actually reading the CVIC Bible so um, that was the time that I actually went and talked to the supervisor and decided that you know what this place is just maybe it's just not for me that's what I actually said to her I didn't feel that way but I just didn't I just feel like felt like I couldn't stay with her any longer all the other people who started at the same time that I did have excellent preceptors I mean they loved them you could see the good interaction that they had and so I had some nurses that begged me to please not leave please just stay here let us precept you I didn't want to be anywhere around her I look back now and I can see that a lot of her problem was she didn't know how to how long to leave that stop cock on uh, that's why she acted like that as for me verbalizing the blood back to her again she was a BSN graduate and she looked down on, on uh, so or not associate degree but diploma graduates so you're gonna face you might face I'm not gonna say you're going to but there is a good possibility that you might face some workplace violence some some horizontal violence and it could be from your preceptor and I highly encourage you to not tolerate that it is not okay to be bullied at work 48% of nurses, pharmacists, and others report strong verbal abuse, and that is from the Institute for Safe Medication Practices. 43% of nurses and pharmacists uh, also experience threatening body language. A study of student nurses reported that 53% of y'all had been put down by staff. Any of y'all dealt with that? 56.9% reported having been threatened or experienced verbal abuse at work. Most of the clinicians, 40% of them, kept quiet or ignored the improper uh, 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 bullying that was occurring. Unmanaged anger contributes to hypertension, coronary artery disease, depression. What do you think I was dealing with whenever my husband said, hey, it's time for you to move on. I can't take this any longer. I can't see you crying like this. Psychological problems, other health problems. It contributes to low staff morale, uh, increased uh, absenteeism, attrition of staff, deterioration in the quality of patient care. Nurses will leave the profession due to lateral violence and bullying. Um, so you get this like big old, just I call it a, a bleeding wound. Um, 
because what we have is we we have nurses who just can't stay there any longer and so they leave and then we fill the gap with with more nurses and we're not doing anything we're not pressurizing what's happening that's making our nurses leave we're just lightly putting a band-aid over it and when we lightly put a band-aid on it we're not going to stop the ooze so what can we do zero tolerance towards violent or abusive behavior protection from retribution if reported uh, utilize employee assistance programs we do have some ourselves for uh, mental health problems interrupt the violence uh, tell them I know what you're doing and you need to stop this is bullying stop you put a stop to it uh, assess the nursing unit and raise awareness brainstorm solutions and encourage uh, open dialogue and create unit specific uh, guidelines sorry sexual harassment that is a persistent problem in the workplace and ladies and gentlemen it happens to everybody uh, major contributors include unequal balance of power between men and women and sex role stereotypes. Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits sexual harassment. There are two forms, quid pro quo, sexual favors are solicited in exchange for favorable job benefits or continuation of employment. Um, the hostile environment. The most common form, the client must prove the harassment, affected conditions of employment, or created an environment so offensive that the employee felt like that they just couldn't effectively perform their responsibilities. Men and women can be both can be victims. Um, I know that um, I'm going to mention this, but it seems like in this day and time, um, maybe it's with certain age groups that it's okay to be sending nude or or compromising pictures um, but some uh, some don't feel like it's okay I'm I kind of happen to be one of those call me a prude or what have you but I don't feel like it's okay but some uh, some people do however you need to remember that if you're sending pictures of your naked body or somebody else's naked body uh, to another person this is this is deemed sexual harassment well they're my friend or they wanted the picture but people can turn on you it can quickly become a thing against you I read a story of a, a young girl and I guess a, a workplace uh, a healthy work environment is uh, one close to my heart here but I read this story of this young girl probably 17 16 or 17 sent her boyfriend a nude picture then they broke up and when they broke up he turned around and sent that picture to everybody on his on in his phone um, so then it got back to the girl and she told her mom and dad what she did and what happened and so when she did they uh, they actually contacted the police filed a report prosecuting attorney filed charges against this young man and uh, he lost in court and for the rest of his life now he is going to be listed as uh, a sexual uh, predator you know child sex predator uh, because she was under age when that was sent out uh, so you know <laughs> You got to be careful. You, you got to be really careful. Tactics to fight sexual harassment, and this is from the ANA. Confront immediately, calmly and firmly. Report it immediately. Document it immediately, and support. Seek support. Uh, uh, seek support from others, uh, and get involved in policy writing again. Um, when I say confront, say again. You need to stop. I know what you're doing and you need to stop I'm telling you uh, they're gonna ask you if you if you go and report it did you tell them to stop um, you know and and I, I I really I really hate that that kind of and I don't I shouldn't say the word hate um, but I really strongly dislike how we do things where we have to ask did you tell them 
not to do it. Um, because a lot of people find it difficult to say stop. A lot of people find it difficult to say you are you are making me uncomfortable. Uh, and the reason being is because they're already uncomfortable. And especially if it's a friend uh, or a coworker, then you're gonna you're gonna struggle with telling them to stop. All right, so discrimination. There are federal laws within the workplace to prevent discrimination. That doesn't mean that it doesn't always prevent it. Um, the you know types of discrimination: race, color, sex, age, disability, religion, or national origin. Employers may ask questions related to this information, but they cannot make decisions about employment based on these. Um, they, I say they cannot. This is, but that doesn't mean that some of them don't, um, because let's face it, we are living in such a wide variety of discrimination in our society, and I think it has spilled over into other areas of our lives, and it, it sadly so. There's, and unfortunately, I just. Sometimes I look and I feel like there's just no hope in changing some of it. I don't know if anybody else feels like that. I just hope and pray that that we can change things that need to be changed and and I hope and pray that we can we can uh, uh, initiate and mandate some laws that that help and prevent uh, discrimination, especially in the the workplace. Because we all have to make a living, and you don't want to work somewhere where you are discriminated against. Um, you don't want to walk around uh, worried that you always have a knife in your back. Uh, I know someone whose family member had to um, decided to, that he needed to retire early um, because he had buddies that that were that worked there at, for the company. Um, and that as they reached a certain age, they were um, <laughs> they they were kind of uh, I want to say dated. They were nice things were done to them before they you know dropped the hammer and said, "We have a severance package for you." And so um, he decided to beat them to the punch and and not have that happen to him when he reached that age because it had started. So you see, there's there are types of there's all types of discrimination, and that one is a to me is a pretty extreme case, and it was hard to believe. If I didn't know this person that was telling me that, I would think they were crazy. Um, in our working environment, <clears throat> there is a very real possibility that any of us can develop an allergy, uh, especially to latex. CDC in 2016 lists tips to help decrease the potential for latex allergy problems. Um, evaluate any cases of hand dermatitis or other signs of latex allergy. <clears throat> uh, use latex-free procedure trays and crash carts. Use non-latex gloves for activities that do not involve contact with infectious materials. Avoid using oil-based creams or lotions which can cause glove deterioration. <coughs> I did not know that one. Um, seek ongoing training and latest information related to latex allergy. Wash, rinse, and dry hands thoroughly after removing gloves or when uh, changing gloves. And use powder-free gloves. We, uh, if you develop an allergy, avoid all types of latex exposure. Wear a medical alert bracelet. Carry an EpiPen with you. Um, alert your employer and colleagues to your to your latex sensitivity, and then carry non-latex gloves. <coughs> <I'm> sorry. <clears throat> Sharps injuries are always a real possibility. We have to protect ourselves. Um, use universal precautions. Use and dispose of Sharps properly. Obtain immunization against Hep B. Get involved in the sharp selection process. Keep your training up to date. Report all exposures immediately. Follow your facility's protocol and then comply with post exposure follow up procedures. I had a student, a student, y'all, who had a sharp injury. Has anybody, does anybody give? I wonder if y'all do. Um, 
Lovenox in uh, if you're giving them in the clinical setting or 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 where you work in Lovenox, it has this like when you're pulling the um, the rubber tip or rubber cover off the needle, it, you have to pull really hard and it pops off. Okay, so when you inject your patient and you're you're you know you're pinched up, you're injecting in to uh, you if you keep a hold of that and and keep pinching or keep uh, keep pushing on the syringe. I know what I'm trying to say. You keep pushing on the syringe. You actually have to put pressure onto your patient in order for you that that needle to retract. It is it is ridiculous. Okay. Um. So I was telling the student this. It's best if what you do is when once you inject your patient with the medication. You pull the syringe out and you push and then it comes out and the, the protective cover comes out <coughs> so if you've never seen one then it's kind of, kind of hard to follow what I'm saying and I, I wish I'd have put one on here uh, a screenshot of one so anyway she didn't follow exactly what I said she took it out and she didn't she didn't spring load that that uh, cover uh, and she put it into the sharps container before as I was trying to tell her to, to stop she it was all happened you know that whole slap thing that I had it all happened like that in a matter of seconds she ended up sticking herself so we had to go down to employee health and fill out all these reports it, it was really really lovely to have to do all of that and then you know of course for her you know she doesn't we don't know if the patient has any you know infectious diseases so it it was a it was a trying time for for her especially be careful guys just be careful all right back injuries lifting uh moving heavy patients use proper body mechanics use in, uh, use lifting moving equipment and techniques save your back we also have repetitive stress injuries from computers uh, so we need to use proper body mechanics. I know that I worked um, on a, a floor once and I turned so y'all could. And so I had to actually turn my back. As you can see, I I was sitting in a position that was not comfortable for, for charting. <clears throat> so one night I came in and I was like, <clears throat> I'm done with this. Hurting my neck. I, I don't know what's going on. You know, I'm... I'm I can't sit like this to, to do my charting anymore. And so I came in and moved everybody's computers where they were we they were on the desk right in front of them. Um, but I knew it needed to be done. It had to be done. You also have toxic environments, disinfectants, um, and uh, toxic contaminated waste. Be careful of old chairs that are on the unit because that's how I injured my back one night, one day in, in the clinical setting. As I went to scoot down, I had an emergency going on, and I sat down in a chair and it had these, these legs that came around like this. <clears throat> um, and as I slid forward to answer the physician's phone call, I, it slid out from underneath me and I smashed my, my butt onto the floor. and. It jarred me, and I just you just had to pay attention to what the pay, the physician was saying and and cry in a, in a minute. So be careful of chairs. Be, there's so many different things. Be careful of moving beds. Save your back. All right, impaired healthcare workers. Um, signs of impairment: you witness the consumption of alcohol or controlled substance on the job. Changes in dress, appearance, posture, or their gestures. Slurred speech, abusive or incoherent language, uh, erratic behavior, significant lack of attention to detail. You witnessed any theft of controlled substances, uh, assigned a patients routinely requesting pain medication within a short period of being medicated, and volunteering to give pain medication to unassigned patients. Those are some warning signs to look for. <clears throat> So in, 1980, in the 1980s, the National Nurses Society on Addiction and the ANA Task Force 
uh, jointly passed a resolution calling for acknowledgement of substance abuse problems and guidelines for impaired nurse programs. Impaired nurse programs are conducted by state boards of nursing. I sat on the state board of nursing as a master's degree student uh, and I was doing a, a master's in administration so that's where I did my clinicals. And so um, they they do, I sat on into a lot of meetings where we discussed uh, uh, impaired nurses and the, the programs that they had there. And they followed the nurses very closely. Um, so the, the state boards work with the employer to assist the impaired nurse. They keep, try to keep them licensed if they can. Um, coworkers must realize that protecting the impaired nurse can pose serious risk for the patient um, and all those working with them. In many states, uh, state laws uh, re require hospitals and health care providers to report impaired practitioners, but grants immunity from civil liability if report was made in good faith. So let's talk about some stress. I, I, <laughs> I doubt any of y'all know about that right now. It's complex. It's highly personalized. Stress levels in individuals can vary very, very very widely. Um, <clears throat> it's a common phenomenon in today's workplace. You have physical demands, indoor climate and air quality, uh, temperature and uh, noise and vibrations, even office design. I say that my office de design per it causes me stress, prevents me to be happy because I don't have a window. <laughs> no. I'm just messing with y'all. <coughs> Task demands. <clears throat> Sorry about that, guys. Um, your task demands are the role demands or interpersonal demands. These are all things that, that um, are common phenomenon for today's workplace stress. And it costs the U.S. industry greater than $300 billion annually. We'll talk about why. So sources of stress for nurses, inadequate staffing, uh, shift work, overcrowding, aggression, violence from patient, family members, or even staff, dealing with people at their worst, dealing with critical illness and death, high acuity patients, and shortened length of stays. It's stressful knowing that your patient might need to be staying longer, but, uh, you know, between hospital and insurance, they've got this little they got this little connection there where they, you know, they we get our patients out a lot faster uh, and cut all these costs. <clears throat> uh, risk of infection or injury on the job. Uh, inadequate compensation. I think we all probably feel this way. Emotionally intensive work. Physically intensive work. And personal or family stressors. <clears throat> Signs that your stress level is too high. <laughs> Can't even imagine what y'all are feeling right now. I've spoken with some of y'all and I understand that that all these changes are, and that's a that's a big stressor for you guys. All of these changes, um, what we're dealing with and, and with the COVID crisis right now. Uh, so it it is a huge stressor. You dread going to work. Um, you, you dread turning your computer on, um, thinking frequently about mistakes and failures, avoiding patients, colleagues, and assignments, using alcohol or drugs to relax after work, and constantly worrying about all of the above. I read a story once of a woman, and this happened in Pine Bluff. She uh, worked at a factory down there. I think it was Pine Bluff. Don't, don't call me. <clears throat> Um, but she worked in a factory and she was dealing with workplace bullying. Um, so she was under a lot of stress and, um, she asked to be moved to a different shift because she just couldn't deal with this person who was causing her so much stress at, and doing the workplace bullying. And so <coughs> anyway, she moved to the next shift and when she moved to the next shift, guess what? This chick followed her. And so she was just, I mean, she, 
I, I read in the story, you know, she was, she, of course, very put out with the higher ups. They knew exactly why she moved to a different shift to get away from this person who was bullying her. And then they moved that person there. And so um, she one day left for lunch, went home, and got a gun, and came back and killed this person who was causing her all of the stress for him all of the bullying that she was doing so stress is real I don't expect you guys please don't please please don't take a gun and um, shoot anyone and please don't shoot the computer if you feel that way please call me let's talk let's see what we can do uh, let's see if we can we can get your stress level down some signs that your stress again is too high it can what it can do for you actually it, it behavioral problems it can lead to tobacco use uh, it can start or it can increase alcohol drug abuse accident prone violence and eating disorders psychologically you just get burned out you have family problems anxiety disorders sleep disturbances sexual dysfunction, depression, conversion reaction, and somatization, uh, psych physiological hypertension, heart disease, stroke, cancer, back pain, arthritis. You, you got it right there. I had a student once who called me after she had graduated and there was some, some massive, massive stuff going on on the the unit that she was working I, I won't go into it because it was it, it was terrible I hope it never happens to anyone um, but let's just say it came from upper management and uh, they um, their solution to answering the nurse problems and the nurse um, the nurse I'm just not happy you know what can we do why didn't anybody tell us this change was occurring those kinds of things uh, was to tell them if they didn't like it they, they don't let the door hit you on in the rear on the way out so she was so stressed and she was a young girl she was in her her mid-20s uh, she went to her doctor because she just wasn't feeling right uh, her blood pressure was ridiculously high and her physician told her you need to quit you need to get away from there you should not have high blood pressure at this age you should not be having this she was losing hair her blood pressure was high she was just unhealthy do not stay in a situation that is doing this to you I find another position um, do talk to someone don't 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 do this don't do this to yourself uh, I just highly highly encourage y'all what are we gonna do how are we going to manage stress? Hospital facilities need to recognize and act for helping uh, to prevent any as many stressors as possible. Provide well-prepared -pre preceptors, that's really important, and mentors for newly employed nurses. Uh, sufficient training uh, uh, for staff, um, or I'm sorry, sufficient staffing so employees can take breaks and obtain vacation time. I, and sufficient training for for preceptors as well that I think that's where my mind just went for a second peer support groups debriefing after critical events have occurred well-developed employee uh, assistance programs for counseling when needed stress reduction training and workshops on-site exercise rooms and on-site relaxation rooms before you go to um, a facility and say sign your name on the dotted lines that this is where I want to work you need to date that facility you need to see about looking at, at when you're in clinical at Baptist ask some of the, the nurses tell me about what type of programs that are here that that can support you for stress management or support you for this what about what about this do you, what type of PTO is there hey find out these things I'm, I'm big on dating the facility 
You're not going to marry the first person that you meet within five minutes after meeting them. You don't want to go into the first place that you interview five minutes after meeting it. You want to date that facility and find out if it's a good place for you because you don't want your stress level to be high and affect your health and affect your family. <coughs> so coping with stress, spend time on, on other interests. Hey, go camping. Go to the lake. Uh, veg out in front of the TV. Uh, identify sources for problem solving. Develop good communication skills and treat others with respect. Do not exceed your limits. You do not always have to work the OT when they call you. Increase uh, your professional knowledge. It can also help alleviate your stress. Have realistic expectations. Sometimes that's hard um, if you are a perfectionist. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a perfectionist so I have some I've had to learn not to have such unrealistic expectations and it's really hard ask questions if you're unsure seek out others who have more knowledge about a situation be a part of a solution not part of the problem recognize you can teach other people how to treat you and I you know I I, I think I say that um, I mean, some people cope with stress by coming home. I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to say things sometimes. But cope with stress by coming home and drinking a glass of wine. If that's how you cope with stress, then that's how you cope with stress. Let's try to keep it to a glass and not a bottle. I, I don't want y'all to develop some other problems. Nurse burnout. It is progressive deterioration in work and other performances resulting from increasing difficulties in coping with high and continuing levels of job-related stress and professional frustration. There are four stages. You have high expectation and idealism. So high energy level and positive attitude. I'm so excited. I'm so pumped. This is my first day as an RN on the floor. Woohoo! Okay, so that's how some of us start. Maybe some of you don't jump around like me and, and act like that, but deep inside, you're all excited. And then you get pessimism and early job dissatisfaction. It's a physical and psychological uh, symptom of stress. And then there's withdrawal and isolation. Yet anger, hostility, and negativism are exhibited. Because see, now you're starting to pick up on some things and you just don't like it at all. Then there's detachment and loss of interest, low self-esteem, chronic absenteeism, cynicism, and total negativity. <clears throat> I think that when you get to detachment, burnout is just inevitable. Um, and withdrawal, simple changes during this stage may reverse that burnout process, so try it. With your pessimist, you know, having pessimism, uh, maybe you're frustrated, you're disillusioned, you're, you may even be bored with that job. So maybe it's time to look elsewhere if you're at a place in your career when you can do so. I, I've been there a lot of times, especially within the first seven years of nursing. And I, I, I was that way right before I came over to the school to start teaching. I thought I, I'm never I, I'm gonna be here working in, in women's and children's and uh, working I, I actually was working the um, resource team is what they called them at that time and that's because I wanted to move to days I was already burning out because I was working nights and I was just tired of working nights my health was bad it, it just it, it affected that I, <clears throat> I was <coughs> 35 years old and a type 2 diabetic um, so I just I just thought that I just need to do something so I went to the resource team I left my my women's surgical unit which I loved uh, I got pulled up there frequently but I was still so unhappy and I didn't know why because I loved my patients and I loved everybody that I worked with but I was probably just feeling that time for a change and that's when the school called me and said you know you filled an application a few months ago are you still interested sure 
So I came and interviewed, and that's when I, I switched to a new job. And um, I think we all, though, even if we're happy in our job, we experience some some type of, of pessimism. Um, and you you just need to see if you can turn things around. Find a new love in your job. Do things that you, you like. Um, see about making some simple changes and see if that helps you. If it doesn't, then again, maybe it's time for a job change if you're in that place. All right, so let's talk about the, the buffer for nurse burnout. Um, your nurse describes this as personal hardiness as a buffer against burnout. It was first introduced by uh, Suzanne Cobasa in 1979. Three general areas describe uh, what personal hardiness is. A sense of personal control rather than powerlessness. Commitment to work and life's activities. Seeing life's uh, demands and changes as challenges rather than as threats. Um, and on the next slide, we'll, we're going to look at some job satisfaction. Job satisfaction encompasses the feelings or attitudes uh, positive or negative that an individual has about his or her uh, work. Uh, factors found to be important in nurse uh, satisfaction. The work itself, uh, satisfaction directly related to the amount of time able to spend caring for their patients. The healthcare team, it's really great when you have teamwork and co-worker support and then you also have adequate staffing. Uh, the employing organization, support and respect from admin, opinions matter, and that your input is valued, that you yourself are valued. Do I think that job satisfaction is an answer to everything? No, but I think job satisfaction goes a long way in helping you to achieve the attitudes that are necessary to withstand uh, some of the, the, the temporary things that come along. So when you're easing the transition, um, develop a professional identity. Challenge yourself to keep on learning. Um, just don't stop. You need to. You also you, you need to demonstrate competency. Learn about the organization. Understand how the organization works. Will give a clearer picture about how and why uh, decisions are made. Use your energy wisely. Much, much energy goes into learning a new job. Communicate effectively. You need to acknowledge problems. Use your communication, problem solving, and negotiating skills. Develop a support network. Identify colleagues who have helped uh, or who have held onto their professional ideas and seek out their help and support. Mentoring. Mentor can provide the support needed to increase new nurses' clinical success and job satisfaction. Expectations and goals. Your first weeks to months as a new RN, again, you're going to go through that that first initial, oh my gosh, I'm so pumped. Now, that's the honeymoon phase where everything is rainbows and happiness. Your orientation is designed to help you learn and transition into your new role. Do not go in there with the expectation that you are a graduate and know it all. Instead, take on the professional student role. You're getting paid to be a student then. Begin to develop a fresh professional identity. All those things that I talked about on the previous slide. Um, whenever you are, and I know that you're probably like a professional student. Let me back up to that. Guys, I, I listen, I, I've been a nurse for almost 20 years. And I do not ever go into the clinical setting, even now with students, and think, I know it all. I got this. I got it. I just don't do that. Um, I go into the clinical uh, setting expecting that there are things that I'm not going to know and that it's going to be very important for me to ask. So don't be afraid to, to, to ask and don't be afraid to, to take on the lifetime learning student role. Um, because it doesn't mean that you're a nursing student. It just means you're a nurse and it means that you are still a student of learning. You still want to know everything that you can possibly learn. Mm -hmm. 
So in conclusion, workplace safety is an area of increasing concern for employees and employers. Be culturally aware of others. Be respectful and emulate the attitudes you want shown to you. And finally, do not lose sight of your goals. Find joy um, and achieve greatness in your, your, pa your patient care. Uh, find greatness in your nursing career. Guys, it's, it's, a, it's a fun place to, to be, I think. Uh, I love how many areas that we can go in. And I, I want y'all to be happy and I want y'all to be successful. I look forward to seeing my students um, on the floor when I come back into clinical. And I look forward to seeing when y'all are in leadership positions and seeing how well that y'all do. Thank y'all for listening.